This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. And I'm Juan Gonzalez. Welcome to all of our listeners and viewers across the country and around the world. As the United States continues to face criticism for tear-gassing asylum seekers on the U.S.-Mexico border, we turn now to look at the crisis in Honduras and why so many Hondurans are fleeing their homeland. Honduras has become one of the most violent countries in the world because of the devastating drug war and the political crisis that stems in part from a U.S.-backed 2009 coup. In a major development, the brother of Honduran President Juan Orlando Hernández was recently charged in the United States for drug trafficking and weapons offenses. Uh, Tony Hernández was arrested in Miami on Friday. Manhattan U.S. attorney Jeffrey Berman accused Tony Hernandez of being, quote, involved in all stages of the trafficking through Honduras of multi-ton loads of cocaine that were destined for the U.S. Hernandez is also accused of providing heavily armed security for cocaine shipments transported within Honduras, including by members of the Honduran National Police and drug traffickers. Tony Hernandez reportedly ran cocaine labs in Honduras and Colombia, where he stamped packets of drugs with his initials TH. Uh, the arrest of Hernandez comes a year after a U.S. judge sentenced the son of the former Honduran president, Porfirio Lobo, to 24 years in prison for conspiring to import cocaine into the United States. Meanwhile, in other news, Honduran police opened fire on protesters earlier this week, marking the first anniversary of last year's disputed election that kept Juan Orlando Hernandez in power, despite calls by the Organization of American States to redo the vote. Honduran, Honduras has been in a political crisis for nearly a decade following the U.S.-backed coup that ousted democratically elected President Manuel Zelaya in 2009. Since then, right-wing forces have led a campaign targeting activists in Honduras, including the prominent activist Berta Cáceres, who was gunned down in 2016 in her home in La Esperanza, Honduras. Eight men are currently on trial for involvement in her murder. A verdict could come as early as today. To talk more about Honduras and why so many migrants are fleeing the country, we're joined by Dana Frank, professor emerita of the University of California, Santa Cruz. Her new book is just out. It's titled The Long Honduran Night, Resistance, Terror and the United States in the Aftermath of the Coup. She recently wrote a piece for Jacobin headlined in Honduras, We're Supporting the Axe Murderers. Uh, Professor Franks, thanks so much for being with us. Why don't you start off by talking about the significance of the current president, a highly contested race that many considered uh, um, fraught with irregularities, um, the current president's brother arrested in Miami for drug trafficking. Well, we've known for a long time, two years now, that Juan Orlando's brother, um, uh, Tony, was involved in drug trafficking. He was, in fact, named in U.S. federal court two years ago. And we know that um, there are drug traffickers from top to bottom in the Honduran government. So, for Hondurans, this is no surprise. What's important is that he actually was arrested and is going to be presumably brought to justice. Um, what this signals, though, is what, we, what people call an outsourcing of the criminal justice system. Why was, uh, why was he not brought to justice in the United States? Excuse me, why was he not brought to justice in Honduras? Um, it shows that there's complete breakdown of the Honduran criminal justice system, that, that this man wasn't brought to justice a long time ago in Honduras. And Dana Frank, according to the federal indictment, uh, they, the uh, the authorities actually have videotape and audio recordings of Tony Hernandez receiving a fifty thousand uh, dollar payment uh, from a drug dealers for his work uh, on, uh, on their behalf. Is it conceivable that all of this occurred, and uh, the president, the the brother of Tony uh -huh. Hernandez, the current president, knew nothing about it? No, and of course, there's also. Uh, there are also testimony where people have said that um, that Juan Orlando himself is involved in drug trafficking. There's a, uh, evidence about his sister, who died in a helicopter accident a year ago, was um, involved in drug trafficking. So th this is this is not just an isolated incident. Um, we have evidence of drug traffickers top to bottom throughout the Honduran government, including in the current Congress. Do you think it's fair to say Honduras is coming close to a narco state? Well, you know, I think that 
it's a narco state. It's, I mean, I guess it depends on your definition of a narco state. Certainly, it's not like you can say, here's the Honduran government fighting the good fight against drug traffickers. And um, that, that doesn't work. There's a lot of people say, well, we'll pour this money into the Honduran security forces and they'll for fight drug trafficking, because the Honduran military is very much involved in drug trafficking as well. And so it's certainly, um, it's certainly infiltrated with drug traffickers from top to bottom. Well, Dana Frank, your book comes at a particularly important time, as clearly the whole nation has been seeing what's been going on at the U.S.-Mexico border with the caravan of migrants from Central America, most of them from Honduras. But uh, there is very little discussion of what is fueling, what is forcing them to leave. And, I, and uh, if you could talk about what has been uh, the, the night of terror that has uh, descended uh, on Honduras, especially following the 2009 coup against—I'm uh, sorry, uh, 2009 coup against uh, President Zelaya. Well, you know, when you read the interviews or the mainstream news reports about why the migrants are in the caravan are fleeing, they'll say, well, they're fleeing gangs and violence and poverty. And that's true. But what's missing from that narrative is where the gangs and violence and poverty come from. It's not a natural disaster. It's actually the result of the deliberate policies of this government that came to the successive post, what we call the post-regime governments that came to power in the aftermath of the coup, most recently the, the illegal government of Juan Orlando Hernandez. And, you know, the, and what they, so if you look at the, those causes, where does all the violence and the gang terror come from? It comes from this um, almost complete destruction of the rule of law. The coup itself was part, was a criminal act, but it's also that it, uh, it opened the doors for every kind of conceivable uh, criminal activity. In that context, the gangs proliferated, drug trafficking proliferated, they're infiltrated throughout the police and military. So you have this situation in which the government itself is implicated in these gangs and in this military that people are fleeing. So it's not just random violence. It's a U.S.-backed regime that, uh, that is in cahoots with this. For example, a lot of people are fleeing gangs or or small business people are their businesses are being destroyed by by gang taxes. Those uh, the police are very much cooperating with the gangs in extracting those kinds of so-called war taxes that the gang members pay. Pay so uh, that excuse me that the gang members charge. So it's um, it's this destruction. It's this lawlessness that then opens the door for this kind of terror that people are fleeing, and the government is very much part of that terror. The second factor here is poverty, because people are very much fleeing poverty, but that poverty, again, is not a natural disaster. It's a direct result of the post-coup policies, because, first of all, the state itself has been destroyed, both by um, neoliberal policies of multilateral development banks, like the International Monetary Fund. Um, state services have been destroyed because the, the elites that run the government are just robbing it blind. For example, the president and his party stole as many as $90 million from the National Health Service in 2013 to pay for their, for their campaigns. And so then there's no National Health Service that functions. And, um, but also the sectors that of, of the economy that are supposed to be the growth sectors are, in fact, what the ones that are destroying the livelihoods. So, for example, palm oil production is being imposed at the point of a gun, killing that kills campesinos who are trying to defend other forms of agriculture. Extractive, extractive mining projects and hydroelectric dams are what are forcing indigenous peoples off their land, and that's why Alberto Cáceres, the famous leader, was killed in 2016. Um, so these these things that are supposed to tourism is forcing uh, the Afro-Indigenous Garifuna people off their land at the point of a gun. The only other functional sectors are agriculture and um, the maquiladora sector, which is apparel and electronics factories for the export market. And those, those, those are very, very destructive of people's bodies under really repressive working conditions. So when we hear about economic development in Honduras, it's actually accelerating more of this destruction, along with the gang activity that is destroying small businesses, because it's not viable to have a small business. I know a lot of small business people that have—I know of people that have been killed if they didn't pay the taxes or they reported it to the police. So there are no other options here. And the other piece of this is those who are trying to have an alternative economic future for Honduras through Libre, the opposition party, through social movements at the base. These are the 
people that are getting tear gas, just like at the Brioz border. These are the people that are getting assassinated. The journalists that report on this alternative vision and the people who would like some kind of democratic alternative, these people are being repressed. So that's the other piece of this, if you're trying to actually achieve some alternative economic model. I wanted to ask you about the repression uh, in the countryside, uh, because I thought that was some of the most graphic uh, uh, material that you had in your book about the, especially the the escalation of the repression, not immediately after the coup in 2009, but uh, in 2011, after Manuel Salaya comes back as a result of a brokered agreement between uh, Venezuela, the leaders of Venezuela and Colombia, other Latin American countries, for him to come back to the country, that actually in places like the Aguan uh, uh, Valley, uh, uh, in uh, the campesinos were subjected to even greater uh, mass repression. Well, some of that is because the the campesinos who had these collectives that that had been in place for a long time and were being forced off their land started reoccupying land that they'd been forced off of by these neoliberal policies and uh, particularly members of the elite, especially Miguel Facuse and his D9 Corporation. So as they start reoccupying their lands and following agrarian reform, legal processes for for reclaiming their lands, then they start being killed one by one, two by two, and what we could call a slow-moving massacre. As many as 150 campesinos have, were, have been assassinated in the Awan Valley beginning in 2010. We're going to break, then come back to this discussion. Dana Frank, professor emerita, University of California, Santa Cruz, her new book, The Long Honduran Night, Resistance, Terror, and the United States and the Aftermath of the Coup. This is Democracy Now! Back in a minute.